we're going to start. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Jay Ferris and Jessica Coulterman uh, coming to you live from the home office here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, a few more people are getting getting logged in as we begin here, so we'll give just a few minutes uh, while people are getting logged into the webinar broadcast. Um, but at this time, we do want to welcome everybody to partake in the webinar this evening. Uh, we are going to be giving you a legislative issue update. Uh, we are going to be talking about the uh, property tax relief packages is going to be our main focus. It's one of our main focuses this year in Nebraska Farm Bureau, and we want to make sure that everyone is aware of what we're doing and how you can help with that. So um, you know, we'll be going over a lot of that, plus some other bills we're working on as well, too. Um, a couple of uh, things before we get started. If at any time uh, you guys have questions uh, as we get into the presentation, feel free to ask that question by either one raising uh, your hand. There should be a little hand icon um, on your control panel. If you raise that hand, I will be able to see uh, that you have a question. I will unmute your microphone. Um, and at that time, and you do have to have a microphone available or you have to call in where, so you can ask that question. Another opportunity to ask a question is there is a question panel um, over in your control panel. And if you click probably a plus button there, if you click down on that, there's a place for you to type in your question. And if I see questions there, I will interrupt Jessica and, and ask those questions throughout our presentation. So there's a couple different ways to ask questions. Uh, we encourage encourage a lot of questions as we go along. That makes our job a lot easier. Um, but with that, I think we, I will turn it over to Jessica Coulterman and uh, can start our presentation. And just so you all know, I'm a bit technologically challenged, so Jay is gracious enough to help me navigate through this. Uh, thanks for being with us tonight. We appreciate you taking the time to get an update on what we have going on. Um, just to tell you a little bit about the session so far, uh, Jay, I'm going to let you move to the next screen. Okay. I'm not, oh, there's my button. <laughs> I see them. There they are. I got it. Yep. All right. So a little bit about the session this year. We had uh, 655 bills introduced this year, and those were all introduced in the first 10 days. So uh, through mid-January about is what that came to. <clears throat> and once every bill that is introduced in the legislature gets a hearing. So we're at the point where we're kind of halfway through the hearing cycle. Um, committees meet different times of the week, and we spend a lot of our time in front of variety of committees here at Farm Bureau. Um, the main committees that we're in front of are agriculture, natural resources. We spend a lot of time in revenue. We spend some time in education, in as much as the finance formula obviously affects property taxes. We spend time in transportation. Um, occasionally, we jump over to government. Um, you know, we were in government today with a bill relating to livestock and uh, the livestock siting process. Um, so, you know, we, we spend a lot of time in front of these hearings. Um, hearings usually run in the afternoon. They start at 1.30 every day that they're in session, and they usually go to about, you know, 5.36 at night, depending on how many bills are up. So it's been some long days, but we've had some, you know, really good days, too. I feel like we've um, had a really good dialogue with the committees. and. They're, you know, kind of winding down in some of those committees where they don't have as many bills, but then in other committees we're just really kind of gearing up. So um, that's where we are in the process, and we'll uh, continue those hearings probably throughout February and into March. So um, that's kind of where we are. Jay, we can go to the next slide. Um, as you all know, like the focus we've had at at Farm Bureau for really the last, well, we've had folks for a long time, but really the last couple of years we've really been pushing the problem with property taxes. And the problem, as you know, and I know I'm not telling you anything that you aren't already aware of, um, ag land values are just going up at a very, very fast high rate. Um, 
you know, this past year the average growth was 16%, but we saw some people that had growth up, you know, 30%, 40%, um, and 88% of the growth in the state has been on ag land. Uh, so we're talking about, you know, comparatively, we're at a very high disadvantage, um, and, and that's the problem, and we need to do something to slow down that rate of growth, uh, do something to reduce property taxes for our members. Um, so that's our focus. That's what we've been working on. And, and as I said, the main place you get that done is in the revenue committee, but it also ties into the state finance formula, uh, the school finance formula. So we've been spending some time in education as well. And our plan is, you know, we had a lot of strategic conversations here at Farm Bureau before the session. And one of those questions was, do we go in and do we tell the senators, here's the plan, this is what you need to do to fix it. Here's exactly what, you know, we want done. And having worked with the legislature for the period of time that we've worked with them, we really have a different way of approaching things. So you had groups come in and say, here's the plan, this is what we want you to do to fix this. And they had plans relating to property taxes, but they also had plans relating to other taxes that they wanted changed. Our idea was to not put it all into one piece of legislation, but rather introduce a series of bills that the senators themselves could say, this is, these are good concepts, and we want to pull from this bill and that bill and piece together our own plan. And we felt that was important because we wanted to give them the opportunity to take ownership of this. So it wasn't us coming in and saying, here's what you have to do to fix the problem. We came in and we offered what we called a foundation for tax relief. So we offered legislation that there were four pieces of legislation. Um, two of them you see on the screen. LB 178 was introduced by Senator Watermeyer, and LB 350 was introduced by Senator Brosh. Both of those reduced ag land value. Um, Senator Brosh's bill 75% to 65%, and that was across the board. And Senator Watermeyer's bill was from 75% to 55%, but that was for the school finance formula only. Um, these bills would provide approximately $80 million to $100 million in savings. This would be directly relief to taxpayers, farmers and ranchers specifically, and um, would we felt would shift to a better balance. And so those are two of the bills that were what we called the foundation for tax relief. We'll move to the next slide here. And then the second part of that was the next two bills are um, putting more money in the property tax credit program. And the idea was that through LB 364, which is Senator Watermeyer's bill, we would take and add $60 million to the property tax credit program for each of each year of the biennium. So you're talking about $120 million total. Um, he was not the only one who introduced this legislation. There were quite a few other bills that were introduced, and they ranged from putting $20 million into the $60 million. Ours was obviously the highest one. But there were some people that introduced a $20 million. I think there was one that had $45 million. Ours was $60 million. Um, and appropriations is the, is the group that actually decides what that looks like, and they put it in the budget. And so they have said, we're going to put in $45 million. Now, I've had some members tell me that that's a starting point for the discussion and that we could possibly get more. I've had other senators tell me, that's the best you're ever going to get. You're not going to get any more in the property tax credit program than that. So we're kind of weaving our way through that, starting to have those conversations with senators, trying to obviously push for as much as we can get. Um, but again, this is a direct credit to taxpayers. And as I was sharing with one of the senators today, this just isn't, the property tax credit program is not just for ag land. This is for all property taxpayers. So that's a, a third piece of the foundation for tax relief. And then the fourth piece deals with reforming state aid to schools. Um, Senator Brosh introduced LB 351, which was a 20% income tax allocation. So I'm just going to use myself as an example. If I pay $250 in state income tax, $50 of that would go back directly to the school district where I reside. And so um, that's kind of how it would work. It would also remove the minimum levy penalty. Um, and our hope is that under this piece of legislation, this would give every school district an opportunity to receive state funds. Um, we hope that it would really 
be beneficial to the rural unequalized districts and that they would be the ones that would benefit from this. Um, it also helped that frugal districts would no longer be penalized. So that was a bill we had before the Education Committee. Um, and that hearing was about 10 days ago. So those are the four pieces that we introduced as the foundation. Um, another concept that the governor had been talking about is to put a restraint on value changes and somehow do something to control the annual changes in taxable value. So whether that's a cap, whether that's saying, you know, you can only have growth, you know, 5% a year or something along those lines. Um, the challenge with this is everybody thinks it's a great concept. The problem is, is actually putting it into legislation and figuring out the right way to draft that legislation legally. So we had tried to look at energy and build it that did this, but the concept's still out there. We're still having discussions with people about it. Um, it's something we will certainly continue to talk to the Revenue Committee and see if that's a concept that can be maybe rolled into some of this other legislation. Um, but but we're not exactly sure the best way to do that, so we're kind of still feeling our way through that. Um, the governor came out in his State of the State address and said we would like to do, his recommendation was that we did $120 million over the biennium over the next two years, which is exactly what we were asking for in our legislation, which is $60 million each year. So he echoed our thoughts and said this is right, this is what we want, this is what I believe is best for the state. And then he also supported the concept of lowering egg land values from 75% to 65%. The difference between his legislation and ours is that his was a phase-in over a certain period of time. I believe it was maybe six years. I think it was four or six years. I don't recall off the top of my head, but his was a phase-in. Ours was a one-time direct relief, um, doing it, dropping it from 75 to 65 immediately. So um, that is something, you know, we just were slightly at different places on it. I think that's something we'll continue to discuss and, and work through. And Jessica, uh, we do yeah. have a question here. Um, okay, And great. it said, one of our stats said that there's $1 billion from land taxes. And the question is that for all uses or just K through 12 schools? And then a comment with that going $60 million tax credit would just be a 6% drop in the bucket. Um, okay, so Jay, I, I didn't quite, you broke up a little okay. bit. Can you just Ask me yeah. that question one more time. The question basically was uh, that our stats said there was $1 billion from land taxes that's collected. Is that for all uses on property taxes, or is that just for the K-12 through school districts? I believe that is for all uses, okay. um, but I don't have the statistics in front of me, but I think that's correct. Okay. And then the comment then on that is that a $60 million tax credit would just be a drop in the bucket, basically, for for that $1 billion. So we get that. Um, the challenge is, and, and this is where my job gets difficult, is I've got senators down there saying that you don't need anything. And so it's hard to go in and say we need more when we're up against people who don't think that we need the relief. And so we're navigating what is possible, um, not necessarily what our ideal is. Um, and, and I know that's frustrating. It's very frustrating for us on a daily basis to be down there and to, to face people that say that. Um, but what I will tell you is it is something. I know it's not this silver bullet that's going to fix the problem and that's not going to go light years in the direction we want it to go, but, but it's something. It's um, real dollars that will show up on a statement that you can you know, pencil out on the back of an envelope. Um, now, part of what we're talking about is we're not just talking about the $60 million in the property tax program, credit program each year. We're talking about it being ongoing. Um, that's part of it. But, but the second part of that is it's in collaboration with these other pieces of the foundation that we talked about. So it's also taking 75% to 65% or 75% to 55% for school finance formula purposes. Or, and, I guess I should say and, it's doing something in the finance formula. Um, something that we did not introduce as part of our foundation package but that has really caught 
on with a lot of senators on the Revenue Committee from what we've been able to tell is personal property tax relief. There's one proposal that would remove all personal property taxes. Now, we've heard some people got really excited about that. Um, you know, that would be, one, it would create less paperwork. <laughs> so I think everyone would appreciate that. But I mean, there could be some significant dollars saved there if you're not paying taxes on personal property taxes on equipment. Um, so there's other things that are on the table. The, the, the challenge is for us, there's probably $300 million in play. And that's just a, that's just a really rough estimate. But a, you know, approximately, I'm just going to say $300 million in play um, for everything they want to do. And that, and that includes any spending, any growth that they have, whether it's 1% or 2% or whatever they end up, you know, spending. Um, that also includes all new programs. And as, if you've been around this as long as we have, there isn't a year that there isn't many, many, many new programs that come before this body or any body where people say, well, we need to do this and we need to do that. You know, um, we don't get before Health and Human Services a lot, but that's the spending they do in that committee makes up, you know, about 44 to 47 percent of the state budget. And there's people before that committee every single afternoon asking for 20 million and 30 million and, you know, 75 million. And, you know, this little bit here and this little bit there, it all adds up. And we're, we're fighting that. Um, and so in order to get any tax relief, we have to start somewhere. And, and for us, that starting place are the things that we introduced as the foundation. I hope that at least addresses that question. Jade, any other questions? Um, um, so right I'm now, gonna... we, we don't have any other questions. But it does give me the opportunity, because uh, we've had a few people that have joined since we did start. And um, when I first made that comment that if you do have a question, there's a couple different ways you can do it. If you have a microphone on your computer, uh, simply click the little hand icon. Uh, that'll raise your hand, it'll get my attention, and I can unmute your microphone. The other option is there is a chat or a question box, and you can certainly uh, type a question, and I will see that question, and I can ask Jessica that question for you that way. So. Um, there's a couple of other packages, I kind of alluded to them earlier in the webinar when we started. We chose to introduce our bills as pieces and let the senators cobble together what they felt was the most appropriate thing to move forward um, for tax relief. There were two other plans that were introduced as packages um, that had a variety of concepts in one bill. One of them was introduced by Senator Davis. Um, and it was LB 280, and I refer to this as the Open Sky Plan. It was it was worked on in collaboration with Senator Davis and the Open Sky Policy Institute. Um, it would take local income taxes, so that local income tax would move. So you would you would lower property taxes. You would raise local income taxes. Um, or create local income taxes and raise those to 19% to 29% and then put that money into offset property taxes. Um, the main gist of it is that every student would have a $500 foundation aid credit. Um, you know, so for every student that attends your school district, you would get $500 um, foundation aid. And it would phase in the levies to 80 cents. Um, but it would also do what we had proposed, which is lower ag land values from 75% to 65% in the state aid formula. The idea would be, in total, decrease property taxes by about $407 million, increase state income taxes to, to help do that, and state aid would be increased as well. Jay, we'll go to the next slide. Um, Senator Smith's plan, which is the Platt Institute plan, um, is LB 357. The idea would be to phase in income tax reduction. So Senator Davis's plan would raise income taxes. Senator Smith's plan would lower income taxes. Um, that would reduce it over a 10-year period of time. Senator Smith's plan would. 
and would also put $60 million into the property tax credit program, um, and <coughs> would also put, um, excuse me, tax on Eggland sales, capital gains, and homeowners. Um, I guess our focus is, this bill, in our mind, is really focused on income taxes and reducing income taxes, which is not a priority for us. So we tend to, while we like the fact that they looked at property tax relief, we tend to feel that this is not the direction we want to go this time. We can go to the next slide. <coughs> so there's three committees that are going to work in collaboration to move forward these proposals. Um, and we've been before all of them already. Um, Appropriations, obviously, is going to work on the property tax credit piece and putting money into the property tax credit program. Um, education is going to work on the school finance formula piece, and revenue is going to work on um, just general tax, property tax issues. So you'll see on the screen the names of the senators who serve on those committees. <clears throat> those are kind of the key players in this. Um, you'll see some of them serve on both committees. Um, for example, Senator Sullivan serves on both the revenue committee and the Education Committee. Um, you're going to have a lot of collaboration between those two committees because of her dual role. Um, if you see your senator on here, we'd love to have you contact them and start talking about our foundation. Yep, and we do have a question. Um, sure. And this one is, what is a $500 foundation aid as a percent of pupil average annual cost? I'm going to just be honest. I don't know. Um, I don't work on the number crunching aspects of these pieces of legislation, and I don't have that information in front of me. So um, maybe that, if you, we can find out if you ask that question, yep. and I can have either Jay yeah. Rempe or um, Levon Heidemann, who have been doing our number crunching on some of this stuff, have them email you and yep. answer that for you. Well, yeah, it was Mark that asked that question, so Mark, we will get you an answer tomorrow. <laughs> we'll. I apologize. I I um I work a lot on the strategy and the collaborative effort to make sure we have the right people on board to get these passed. When it comes to number crunching, that's not my strong suit. So I don't I don't deal with it very much. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, this is um, turn my camera back on. Uh, so unfortunately, you guys get to see me again, but uh, a couple of different things where, um, and this is where we're needing your help. Um, Jessica did an excellent job of explaining the foundation and the and the four main bills we're really focusing on, um, and we currently do have an action alert up right now that is up tonight. Um, we will be taking that down tomorrow, but what that one is, is asking you to contact your elected official, uh, your state senator, to support the concepts and the four bills that Jessica just outlined. However, we have one, this uh, LB350, um, and this is going to be an action alert that will actually be going out tomorrow is the plan. Um, LB350 is going to be up in front of the Revenue Committee next Thursday, uh, February 19th at 1.30. Uh, for those of you that would like to come to Lincoln, uh, like to sit in on that hearing, we would invite you to do that. Uh, but the action alert itself is going to be asking you to contact members of the Revenue Committee. Um, it's going to be a targeted alert asking you to um, ask them to support this. Uh, so that is the gist of that. Uh, there will be some more background on it as well that we will send out. So please be looking for your email uh, tomorrow, um, possibly Saturday if it doesn't get done tomorrow. Sometimes those take a little longer than we would like them to, but uh, that's going to be the gist. And along with that, and obviously at the hearing, you know, at any time, I mean, Hearings are interesting. Um, I happen to have the fortune of getting to sit in on some hearings today, and I don't get to do that every day. And for me, it was very interesting. And so if you'd like to come to any hearing, please feel free to, if you're in Lincoln and would like to, get a hold of one of us, Jessica or myself or Jay or LaVon, and we'll help you through that as well, too. Um, but next Thursday, again, is the hearing. And speaking of next week, uh, we are having our Ag Edge Conference, and this is the commercial part of our uh, <laughs> webinar uh, next week on February 19th and 20th at the Lincoln Cornhusker Marriott Hotel is our Ag Edge Conference. This is formerly known as 
the legislative conference. Uh, it's a few changes to it, but uh, in you know it's pretty much uh, you know rebranding what the legislative conference was. One thing that is not changing with this is we are having a reception with senators on Thursday evening. This is an excellent opportunity for you to get FaceTime with your senator, with other senators from urban areas. We have senators, uh, I believe, I counted today, about 26 senators are scheduled to come. Uh, so this is an excellent opportunity for you to share Farm Bureau's views on these bills and others. Uh, let, them, let them know that you support these and you'd like to see them work to get something done on property tax relief. And I say that is going to start um, around noon on Thursday. I don't have the exact schedule and agenda. But if you come down and would like to slip over for a little bit and attend that hearing on Thursday, you can feel free to do that as well, too. And you won't miss a lot of the conference. You'll miss a, a little bit. But, uh, you know, we, we will understand if you skip out to go to the hearing on that, too. And, and I will most likely be at the hearings. I will uh, not probably be spending a lot of time at the conference merely because this legislation is up during yeah. the conference. So. Yep, and I plan on probably being there as well, too. We have our Collegiate Farm Bureau is going to be host having a, kind of a learning session at the Capitol on Thursday for the first day of Ag Edge, and I'm going to work with them a little bit. And they're going to be sitting in on the hearing as well to kind of get some of that experience. So. Hopefully we'll see you there, but we will, both Jessica and I will be at the, at the conference as well, too. So um, another way for you to take action and really get out there, let your voice be heard with your senator, and that's to any time your senator is having a town hall meeting um, or going to be doing something in the district, uh, make sure that you try to, to attend that. Uh, let them know your thoughts on, on these bills and others. Um, one of them that we know about is uh, here com this coming Saturday uh, at 9 o'clock in the morning in Hastings, and that's with Senator Seiler. Uh, that is put on by the Hastings Area Chamber of Commerce and the Adams County Farm Bureau. So uh, it's open to everyone um, or to his constituents in his district. gives you an opportunity to listen to Senator Seiler and also ask him some questions. We also know that uh, there are others that we're not aware of, but we do know that uh, Senator Hughes in District 44 holds conference calls with his constituents uh, a couple of times a week, uh, typically in the morning. And so I'd encourage you to contact their office to get set up on that conference call if you live in Senator Hughes' district. Um, other than that, get a hold of us. We will, anytime we hear of a hearing, I will try to get it out as an email to you so that you know, um, not a hearing, but a town hall, so that you can take advantage of those in your area when your senator's coming out. Because that's a fantastic way to get some face time with your senator and let them know that you're, you're paying attention to what's going on there, too. So. Yeah, it's, it's really helpful to us. Um, you know, I can be down there every day and talk to senators. Um, we have Levon Heideman doing the same thing. Jay comes down, um, but they don't. You know, they care what we say, but but it it speaks volumes to hear it directly from you. Um, I, we had a Farm Bureau member who called me the first week of the session, and he said he had come when we had endorsed uh, Governor Ricketts to one of our events when we did the travel around the state with the governor, and he had shown then candidate Ricketts his property tax statement. And uh, uh, candidate Ricketts was very um, aware after. I mean, he knew prior to that, but he really became very acutely aware of a very specific circumstance with one person's tax statement. And so the first week of session, he called and he said, I'd like to show the now governor that same tax statement this year. And so we helped facilitate that, and Governor Ricketts ended up using that in his state of the state address. So. I'm down there every day talking to the governor, talking to the senators about your specific tax situations, um, but it, it isn't the same as hearing about it from the person who lives it, who can put a tax statement, a numbers, and a situation, and a personalized story in front of those people. And so anytime you have the opportunity to do that, whether that is in your hometown when you run into them at the grocery store, you go to their town hall meeting, you see them you know, wherever. Um, calling them up on the phone, having a personal connection to them and telling them that story from your perspective, how this impacts you personally, makes our job much, much more effective. So yeah. anytime you can do that, we appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, one other question before we move on, Jessica, is, um, and I can, I'll 
take a stab at this first, and then I'll let you go as well, too. But any school board members listening to these concerns about uh, the property taxes and spending on schools, and and I think we, I think they are listening, uh, quite honestly. However, I will point out, and this is my advertisement again for that local issues. Um, this is definitely something for you to work on as county farm bureaus, as uh, private citizens, to make sure you're also lobbying your school board members, your county officials, your local officials, because in a sense, I mean, that is where your property taxes are being spent. And, you know, while I understand that, you know, maybe they're, they have constraints on their uh, budgets as well, but especially during budgeting time next, this right. coming uh, September, August, September time frame, everyone, every school board across the state, every county, every township, um, fire district is going to have to have some sort of budget hearing. And it's really important to attend those and, and, and let yeah. those folks know that you're, 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 you want them to do something about the, the spending of, the, of whatever they can do. So. What I will tell you is, you know, we, we sit there in the education hearing and we hear people, school after school, superintendent, superintendent after superintendent come up and say, we need more money. And I sometimes have to physically restrain LeVon Heidemann because <laughs> it's, it's just, it's really surprising because in some of these districts, you know, we know what the numbers are doing. We know that they've gone up by 30, 40 percent. And our question is, well, where did all this money go? Um, and and we, you know, I can't answer that. I'm not on the school board making the budget decisions. Now I know one of the things we hear back is the health increase in in healthcare costs and insurance. And and I do I do understand that we we have that you know we see that here through our agents we hear about it. But um, that can't be all of it. So asking those questions, um, you know, we continue to hear from school board members across the state. No one is showing up at their budget hearings. No one is showing up to talk about spending. Even even with us encouraging members to do it, so um, you know we'll continue to try to get the word out about that. And anything you can do to continue to get in front of your local school boards, your local county boards, your local ESUs, your local fire districts, your local NRDs, wherever the money is being spent, um, that obviously needs to continue to occur if possible. So. Okay. Well, that's all we have for the questions right now. So let's go ahead and move on if you're ready. Yep. And once again, if you have any questions, please feel free to bring those up by either raising your hand or typing the question in. So, um, I do want to talk about some livestock things we've got going on because one of the ways we say we can fix property taxes in this state is to grow the base. And um, livestock growth is one way to do that. Um, <clears throat> we have three bills that we've been involved with this week, actually. One of them is LB 106 with Senator Watermeyer. That was a livestock siding bill. Basically, what <laughs> it does is it takes away, I mean, at the very court, in my best way to describe this, is it gives counties, county boards who are looking at siding livestock operations, some criteria to really make objective decisions. Um, <clears throat> it, it doesn't take away, you know, we had people saying, oh, it takes away local control. No, it still leaves the actual decision to the local boards. But what it does is it says, Here's a list of criteria for you to score these people on in terms of have they followed the processes that are best practices. So it sets up a matrix where you can score things. You know, did the people bring it, wanting to bring in the livestock expansion, did they work with the neighbors? Um, did they put in a, <coughs> um, for example, uh, odor footprint program where they can share that specific knowledge? Did they put in some, some odor mitigation facility, um, I'm, I'm losing my words here, did they put in yeah. some ways to control odor? Did they mm -hmm. um, do some of these things that are best practices in the industry? You know, it gives criteria for looking at the different sizes of the facilities. And basically, it takes all these matrix, it adds them up, and you can get points for all these different things. And then based on whether or not, you know, they pass or fail with this matrix, that gives the county board some objective criteria to look at when making this decision. Yep. What we see, what we hear, what we've witnessed, um, you know, factually, is a lot of people, a vocal minority, coming in and saying, oh, you can't put in a livestock facility, I won't be able to breathe, I won't be able to hang my clothes on the line, my children won't be able to go outside, we're going to be confined to our homes because of all this pollution, it's going to ruin our water, it's going to 
ruin our land, and they go on and on and on. But there's no proof of it, and there's no, um, you know, there's no, there's no science behind that. And so, basically, we feel that this process, which was endorsed by, and that was developed in collaboration and endorsed by NACO um, and members of the NACO group. Yep. Um, this is an opportunity for us to remove some of that emotionally charged rhetoric and bring it more back to a scientific foundation and look at best practices and look at good good actors in the industry who want to put in livestock facilities so they can grow their farms so they can maybe bring a child back to work on the farm. Um, and and it, it's really, I think it's really exciting. I get really um, positive feedback from from county board members I've talked to about this and we had a really great hearing today. Um, the people that, that oppose it tend to believe that it takes away all local control and it doesn't. The county boards can still make that final decision. This just gives them objective criteria to look at. And you're right, Jessica. A couple other things that I'll point out on that as well is it also creates some uniformity between counties. Um, we've had, you know, going working on these type of issues for a number of years, it's amazing. In fact, we had a person that testified today that talked about um, they were expanding their livestock operation, and they live on the county line, and they first tried to put it on one side of the county line, and they met fierce opposition. Um, the zoning regulations were, were different, moved it across the road basically into a, a na the neighboring county and had no opposition whatsoever and the zoning regulations were more friendly. It didn't really change anything other than the side of the road that this right. facility was on. This and one would, of those... This would give a those, little bit more uniformity to, to counties that way so that... Uh, well, and, and one of those sides of the road got the tax base. That's right. <laughs> one, exactly. one of those counties got the tax base and one didn't. So, that's right. Um, so that's LB 106. Uh, we've been working on that for about six months with the cattlemen, with the pork producers, with NACO, um, with the dairy people. And, and you know, another thing is we, we, we knew this, we'd heard this, but we were able to find specific cases and specific examples of groups who um, we wanted to move here from other states and move their livestock facilities here because of some of the overregulation that they've had in their states. And we were able to share with the senators that Nebraska has in some ways gotten a reputation for being a, a negative place and people have stopped looking at Nebraska or considering it because of some of the, the county um, pushback that they've gotten from people when they try to expand and go into these counties. So this would maybe takeaways for that, we're hopeful. Um, two other bills that we were really involved with earlier in the week <clears throat> were LB-175 and LB-176, both introduced by Sen Senator Schills. One would allow for producers to contract with packers to raise um, swine in Nebraska. Um, interestingly enough, uh, I, I feel like this bill really has an opportunity to move forward this year. Um, and, and it isn't because there were a lot of new arguments presented or um, a lot of new information. It's just the makeup of the committee, the makeup of the body, um, a more friendly arena for livestock development and growth. Um, and the second one, LB 175, was the Livestock Growth Act. And what that bill would do is it would, if you're a livestock-friendly county, it would give a, you, as a county, some opportunities to apply for some funding to maybe develop a site to have it ready to go for livestock, you know, maybe um, fix a bridge or um, put in, a, you know, some better roads or something like that in a certain area and try to help those counties even prepare more for a livestock um, process, a livestock facility or a livestock um, site. So those are those bills and we're really hopeful that these are all going to move forward in a positive manner, so we'll see. Any questions about those? I don't see any questions as of right now. <clears throat> okay. Um, some others, there's a proposal to do more dairy recruitment. There's a bill on that. Um, I mentioned the packer contracting the swine and the livestock siting process with counties. So all of those are things that we're working on. Those are priorities. Um, you know, we have priorities of property taxes. We have priorities of property tax relief through growth. So the livestock growth fits into that. Nice picture of a pig there, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> that would be um, Whitney's doing, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, 
just a little bit about kind of the rest of the session. We're going to start working on the budget. Uh, the, the property tax discussion is going to be a, you know, a big part of that discussion of the budget. Um, as, you, as you might know, we as Nebraskans have a balanced budget every year. It's required by our Constitution. We also um, have a cash reserve. Over 3% of our entire budget is required in the cash reserve, but our cash reserve is a, a high. And some of that money will inevitably be spent and given back to the taxpayers, either in property tax relief, in um, income tax relief, in <laughs> some kind of relief. Because I think there's a lot of people who feel that the cash reserve is too high and needs to be brought down to a, a lower level. Um, and then all the new spending. And, you know, I forget how much new spending is out there every year until I flip through hearings and I get bored in one hearing and wander over to the next one and I hear a price tag on some little, little program um, and they, they call it for, you know, 20 million or 10 million and, you know, that all adds up. So they'll be, they'll inevitably be that. Plus there's the, the, it, the idea that if the committee, if the appropriations committee can keep spending to about 2% to maybe 3%, they feel that they can really do some significant tax relief. Um, I'm not confident they're going to be able to keep it at that level. Last year was around 5%. Um, I know that the governor's plan is to keep it low, and I, I hope they're able to do that. We'll see. Um, we have a group of senators on there who have indicated they're committed to that, uh, but there's five, and you need five for every vote. So if you're going to do that. So we'll see how that moves forward. We'll go to the next slide. I think we're done. Okay, that's it. Um, I do want to just really briefly give a plug for our PAC fundraiser. Um, next Wednesday night, which is the night before the Ag Edge Conference, we are going to be having a fundraiser for the Political Action Committee. We would love to have you attend if you are going to be in town coming to the Edge Conference. If you're not able to come to the Edge Conference and just want to come for the PAC dinner, we'd be thrilled to have you there as well. The cost is $100. It is at the Nebraska Club. Um, we're super excited that U.S. Senator Ben Sass has agreed to come and be our speaker. He's thrilled to be doing it. He's, he's excited. He's fired up. I, I've heard from his staff how much he's looking forward to it, and um, I, I'm really quite thrilled that he's going to do that and be there. He's, he's looking forward to sharing with us about what he's working on and wants to talk to us about, you know, his race. And, and he really felt that Farm Bureau had a significant role in his success, and he, he wants to, you know, share some, some takeaways from that. Um, so I think it'll be a really good night. I'm, I'm really excited, and I hope some of you are able to make it. Um, if you have an interest in attending, please let us know, and we'll get you on the list. And um, if you have any questions, let Sarah and myself know. We can we can fill you in. Absolutely. Um, we do have another question here. Great. It is, what will happen if the cash reserve runs out and the tax credit uh, gets cut? Has that been thought about or discussed? Um, by law, we're required to keep 3% in the 3% of the full budget in the reserve. So I guess I'm not exactly sure if it runs out, meaning that the extra that they decide to spend doesn't go to the property tax credit program. Um, not exactly sure about that question, but what I will tell you is the plan under the appropriations budget as it is written and the governor's budget as he has proposed it, both of them do not take money from the cash reserve for property tax relief. Both of them take money from the general fund to put into the property tax credit program for property tax relief. So at this time, they're not looking at the cash reserve for property tax relief. They're looking at the general fund. Now, I do think they will take money from the cash reserve for some other things which will allow the money in the general fund to be used for property tax relief because it's not being used for these other things. So right now, as I understand it, and I think we all understand it who are working on this budgeting process with, with the property tax relief in mind, as we all understand it, 
property tax relief is the top priority of the legislature when it comes to tax relief. Property taxes trumps the others at this time, as I understand it, based on all the conversations I had with all the senators who are players in this process. Um, they've heard the message that you as members, you as farmers or ranchers have been sending, which is we need property tax relief and we need it now. So I believe the first thing they'll fund is the property tax relief. Then they'll start looking at other things. So I hope that answers the question. I don't know if I got to exactly what you were asking. Um, if you want to rephrase it and ask me more specifically something, I might be able to do a better job. Okay. Hope that helps. <laughs> yeah. I don't see that he's uh, or has another question there. Uh, okay. If he does, if it was Shane, so Shane, if you do have another question or if it didn't answer answer your question, let us know. Um, you know, and once again, if there are any questions, please feel free to type those in the question box or. Uh, uh, raise your hand. We can unmute your microphone, too, if you have any questions. Um, One of the things I do want to emphasize is I believe we will get some sort of property tax relief this year. I've had a lot of people say, what you're trying to get is a drop in the bucket. What you're trying to get isn't enough. What you're trying to get doesn't do anything for me. My response to that is I completely understand when you're looking at your tax statement where you're coming from. But the challenge is that we don't have the amount of people down there pushing for these types of things that we did 30 years ago. And while we're working really, really hard to keep rural people and ag interests in the legislature serving our members, population-wise, it's, it's a challenge. Um, and we're fighting an urban slanted legislature. Um, that being said, if we can cut it 10%, if we can put $200 million in the property tax credit program every year, um, that is relief. It's maybe not the amount that everyone is hoping for, but it does in some way slow the growth or provide direct relief. So we're working as much as we possibly can, and we're fighting for every piece that we can get. And that's absolutely correct. And the other thing I'll point out on that, um, here about a week ago, I had the opportunity to travel um, out to Sydney with Steve Nelson and, and Craig Head and myself. Um, he had about three or four stops along the interstate talking about this property tax relief program that we're working on. Um, that shows you... Our efforts, this is a full court press for Farm Bureau. This is, we have some, the stars are aligning right to hopefully get something done this year, but it still doesn't mean that it's easy. And we need your help. We need you to contact your senator and contact the Revenue Committee and let them know that this is something that needs to be done. It needs to be done this year. Um, and, you know, the, the four bills that we talked about, the, the concept, lowering valuations, increasing the money to the property tax credit program, and then looking at, you know, some other way of, of funding the, you know, the school aid formula or getting some other dollars into that are all part of that plan, and that's what needs to be conveyed. The other thing, and I think this is very important when you're communicating that, is you need to not worry so much about a lot of the details, but worry about your story. Tell your story of how these property taxes are affecting your farms, your ranches, because um, that's the message that's going to move this across the finish line for us. It really is. We need those stories. Share those stories with us, too. Um, Craig Head is working on trying to compile those stories for us so we can put them together and share those. Share your story um, not only with uh, elected officials, but with um, media. Maybe it's a maybe he'll need a letter to the editor, and we'll ask you to do that so that um, it's it's selling this or it's telling this story not only to elected officials but other people, um, other citizens, so they understand what the issues are. And uh, you know, so it's not going to be an easy easy battle, but we hope that we can actually get something done. So, any other questions? 
Otherwise, we might just call it a night. I think we might. I don't see any other <laughs> questions at this point. So I want to, once again, thank everybody for being on the call or on the webinar this evening. Um, and at any time, if you ever have any questions, please feel free to call us. Um, Jessica, myself, Jay Rempe, LaVon, um, anybody here um, at Farm Bureau, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to share those. Um, and uh, hope we, hopefully we will see you next week at our Ag Edge conference. Um, or, um, and I also had mentioned uh, the tour that we did. We are working on trying to get to other parts of the state as well, too, uh, to get Steve likes to come out and, and visit with Farm Bureau members and talk about what we're doing. And, and we're going to try to hit, um, you know, maybe the northeast, uh, southeast, um, North Central areas that we haven't been to yet. So that's stay tuned. Check your email often because we will uh, let you know uh, when we're going to be in your area with those. Thanks, everybody. And please don't hesitate to reach out if we have other questions we can answer for you. Yep. Have a good night. You bet. Thanks, everybody.